Hello everyone from Math 1340 St Statistics. It's Professor Winston here again with a video on uh, the Newton Alta homework for section 2.7. It's measures of the spread of the data. All right, so we've seen measures of center, right? The mean, the median, the mode. Now we're talking about measures of spread. You know, how far apart do the data seem to be? Right. Um, you know how 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 closely concentrated is the data? Right. So we're going to see some values called the variance and the standard deviation. The lower those values are, the closer the data is. The the more tightly packed, the more consistent the data is. The larger those values are, the more far apart the more the less concentrated the data will be all right we'll see that coming up here all right so I'm in the preview for you know, you're not going to see the word preview right you're just going to see the title mastery bar there are fi five objectives in this in this assignment and the one I'm currently on here is uh, compute the variance and standard deviation all right these two, these two words, these two uh, the names here, variance and standard deviation, these are examples of measures of spread. Okay, so I'm going to go to more instructions since it's the first time I'm seeing this. Right, again, I'm hope I'm hoping that you're also reading your OpenStax book, you know, section 2.7 there, and watching the videos I've put up from YouTube and taking notes. I'm hoping you're doing all that as well. So calculating variance and standard deviation. So a lot of definitions here. Uh, the difference between a data value and the mean of the data set. Right? So in order to find the variance and standard deviation, we're going to have to find the mean as well. So the difference between a value and the mean is called its deviation. How much do you deviate from the mean? How far off of the mean are you? In a data set, there are as many deviations as there are values in the set, right? Every single value has a deviation. Every single value is so many units away from the mean. These deviations are used to calculate what's called the variance and the standard deviation of a data set. Both variance and standard deviation are measures of spread. They help quantify how closely concentrated the data values are to the mean of a set, or how far they are spread apart from that mean. Uh, the standard deviation will be zero if all the data values are equal, right? so there's no spread. Right? Zero spread, every single value is the same, and will get larger as the data spreads out. Right? So the further away the data spreads out from the mean, uh, the larger this standard deviation and the larger this variance will become. All right, so let's, let's go about how to find the variance. All right, we'll start with variance and then go into standard deviation. So in order to calculate the sample standard deviation, Right, and you're going to see that there's a different calculation for samples and for populations. All right, so you have to pay attention to do I have a sample of data or do I have the entire population? So in order to calculate the sample standard deviation, you must first calculate the sample variance. To calculate the sample variance, add up the squares of the deviations, right, how far every value is from the mean, and then square them. Add those up, then divide this sum by the quantity n minus 1, where lowercase n here is the number of values in the sample, the size of the sample. Right. To calculate population variance. Again, there is a huge difference. Please be aware. Please pay attention. Do you have a sample or the entire population? 
because this is a little different. To calculate the population variance, you start off the same, add up the squares of the deviations, and then divide this quantity by capital N, all right, not N minus 1, where capital N is the number of values in the population. All right, so you divide by the number of values minus 1 if you have a sample, but you just divide by the number of values if you have a population. So please, please be aware which one you're talking about. Now the notation. All right, so there's a little how to, you know, given the sample mean, remember X bar, remember this little X bar here? X bar was the sample mean. Calculate the sample variance. So you have S, S squared, all right? You see S squared, that notation, that means you're talking about the sample variance. X is just representing one specific value of data. X bar represents the sample mean and lowercase n here represents the size of the sample, how many values there are. Now, you may have seen this symbol before. This looks like an E. This is called sigma. I'm going to write this out on paper as well when we get into an example. Whenever you see this big E looking thing, this sigma, it means you're adding, it means you're taking a sum. In the parentheses here are the deviations. See x minus x bar, x minus x bar, that's a deviation. That's you take a value x and subtract the mean. That's how far away the value is from the mean. So you have a deviation in the parentheses, and then you square those deviations, and then this symbol out front, the sigma, is telling you to add up all those squares of the deviations. And once you've taken that sum, divide by n minus 1, as was described up in the paragraph here. That's for, a, again, a sample, right? The sample variance. All right. So let me take you through an example, um, and I'll do this one on paper. All right. So, I mean, they do it for you and everything, but I'm going to write it out as well to show you what you're going to be doing by hand. Uh, then I will also show you you know, how to find it on your calculator, right? We'll do it all at the same time. So for example, let's calculate the variance of the small data set, you know, here, you know, keeping this information at a table, okay, blah, blah. So I have a data set, and let's assume this is some sample. All right, I'll write this out and come back on a piece of paper. Okay, so here I am on a piece of paper. Um, this is that data set with, you know, five values, so the, uh, again, I'm, uh, it's a sample, so I'm using lowercase n for how many values there are. The size of the sample, right, there are five values. And uh, if I want to find the sample variance, right, find the variance of this sample, which is denoted by lower, uh, lowercase s squared, right? You see that s squared, that means sample variance. Um, first, we need to find the mean, right? Find the mean. Now remember the mean, that's, you know, if I call each of these values, if I call this data set capital X or something, say it's data set X, then, you know, then I'll call the mean X bar. And you've seen how to find the mean before, right? You just add up all the values. So you might see it written this way, right? This wasn't in the instruction, but there was this symbol. Right? This this is the symbol, and I've said this was this was called sigma, right? This is the Greek letter sigma. And whenever you see it, it means you're adding. Right, you're taking a sum, right? Sigma, sum, they both you know, start with S. So you add up all the values, and you know, if I'm calling this data set X, every single individual value is a, is, is a different value of X, right? So I write little x here. Little x represents just an individual value. And then we divide that sum by how many there are, by the size, right? So there's a little formula written in fancy notation for the mean. 
So this sum of the x's, well, the x's are these, right? So that's 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 8 plus 8. Then divided by, that's the sum of the x's, divided by the size, right? How many there are? 5. And this is just 25 divided by 5 or just 5. Okay, so the mean value of this sample, the sample mean is 5. All right. Then we're going to find all the deviations. Okay, and I'm going to make a little table for this. All right. So then going to find all the deviations. Now remember, a deviation is just how far a value of, from the data set is from the mean. Right? You just subtract the mean. So I'll make a little table. Here's the, the values of x, the values from my data set. There are 2, there's 3, there's 4, 8, and 8. All right, sorry, let me pull this up. So there's the values from my data set, the, the x's. Then you know, the next column will be the, the deviations. I take each of these values of x, I take each of the data set values, and I subtract the mean, or just subtract 5. Right? So the deviation for 2 would be, you know, 2 minus 5 would be negative 3. All that means, all that means is that 2 is 3 below the mean, right? 3 less because it's negative. Right, negative means it's below. So it's 2 is 3 units below the mean. 3, you know, do 3 minus 5, it's negative 2. That just means that this value is 2 units below the mean. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. That just means that, you know, 4 is 1 unit below the mean. 8 minus 5 is positive 3. So this means that this is 3 units above the mean, right? It's positive. It's greater than the mean. And another 8 minus 5 is another 3. Right? So this, this data value is 3 units above the mean. So here are the deviations. Right? This column here is all the, the deviations. Right? But we don't just want the deviations. Um, what we're going to do next is, because you know, uh, if you add up the deviations, you're always going to get 0. You, you can do that for any data set. If you add up the deviations, you're always going to get 0. Try it add these up, it's zero. And that's for any data set. So that doesn't give us anything interesting. So for this variance that we're trying to find, right, the sample variance, S squared, remember, right, I'll, I'll write the formula here. Here was the formula for S squared, the, the sample variance that you saw in the more instruction. It was the sum, right, you see the sigma, the sum of, and then you have this X minus X bar squared. This is the sum of the deviations squared in the numerator, and then divided by, and then the size of the sample minus one. All right, this was the formula you just saw. Well, I have the deviations, but I want the deviations squared. So that's what my next column will be. I'll take each of these deviations, the x minus x bars, and square them, which will make everything positive or non-negative. Right? Negative 3 squared is positive 9. Negative 2 squared is positive 4. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. 3 squared is 9. 3 squared is 9. All right. And then, you know, so for the numerator, all right, for the numerator in this sample variance formula, I'm now adding up the values in this column. These are the squares of the deviations. So what's the sum of the squares of the dv... Oops, sorry, that should be x minus x bar. What's the sum of the squares of the deviations? Well, that's, you know, 9 plus 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 9. All right, so that's 32. All right, 32 is, you know, 27 plus 5. All right, 32. That's the numerator for my variance calculation, my sample variance. So I'll have 32 in the numerator divided by, and then what's n minus 1? Remember, n was the size of the sample. How many values were there? There were five values. So this is 5 minus 1. That's just 4. 
and what's you know, so that's the denominator 32 the sum of the squares of the deviations and 4 one less than the sample size and 32 divided by 4 is simply 8 All right um, so the the sample variance is 8 now the units on this I know I, I wasn't given like feet or inches or miles or anything um, notice that we're squaring a bunch of stuff so technically uh, the variance is going to be in square units so units squared or you know square units not the same units as the original data but here we go there was our sample variance okay. eight square units and they go through the same thing I just did here right Let's see s squared equals eight so eight is the variance now what does that tell us well again the it, it, it gives us an idea as the how spread out you know what's the concentration of the data and really you just compare this to other samples so if I had another sample with a variance of a hundred then this sample with a variance of eight is much less spread out than the one with a variance of a hundred you know uh, you know, and if I if I had another another sample with a variance of five, you know, the sample with a variance of five would be less spread out than the one with eight. Right? So it's just a measure. It just gives us an idea of the degree of spread, or the concentration of the data. Okay, so now that we've seen an example as to how to find the sample variance by hand, uh, let's do it on the calculator. All right. So let me show you. I'll pull up. I'll pull up the calculator here, and I'm going to enter these five values. Now this is actually from a previous, all right, let me pause this here. Okay, so I refreshed the calculator. Let me go in and enter these five values, right, the two, three, four, eight, eight from this sample. So I you know, turn the calculator on, hit the stat button, we'll edit and make a list. Now there's only five values, so actually you can watch me do this, two, three, four, eight, and eight, you know, I enter these down list one, say, and get out of here. And suppose I want to have the, the, the variance, the sample variance come up. Well, you can do just the variance, right? Um, if you go to above the stat button, you see list, go second, and then stat where the list, and then go over to math, and then scroll down. And you'll see, you know, std dev, that's standard deviation, which we'll get to in a second. And right beneath that is variance. And then what, what list of data do I want to find the variance of? That was list one. And I'm pretty sure this is the sample variance. And yes, it is, right? It gives me eight, right? Remember, the, the, there's a difference between sample variance and population variance. In, in the sample variance you divide by n minus 1. In the population variance you divide by just capital N, right? Just how many values there are, not not minus 1. So yeah, that's that's a quick way you can do it on the calculator, right? And, and you can see that you know when I did this on paper, you know there were only five values here and, and it takes a lot of writing, right? It takes a lot of time to find the variance by hand. So I'd practice it at least once or twice just to get the hang of it, used to the used to the notation and stuff. Um, but other than that, you know, for the most part, when we go to find the variance or the standard deviation, uh, I'm going to use the calculator. All right. Okay, so the variance is eight square units. All right, so now the standard deviation is very simple. You know. See how it says, we have been calling the sample variance S squared. The sample standard deviation is S. So to find this, if you know the sample variance S squared, to find the sample standard deviation, just take the square root. All right, so meaning that once you have found the sample variance, you only need to take the square root of the variance to find the sample standard deviation. So going back to my example again, all right, so here was the sample variance for this 
sample I did out by hand. 8 square units. For the sample standard deviation, just plain old s, I just take the square root, right? So, the sample standard deviation, or just, you know, the standard deviation is uh, the following. You just take the square root of the variance. So let's take the square of both sides, you get s equals, you know, the square root of 8 or if you want to simplify the square root, remember this is the square root of 4 times the square root of 2 from algebra, you know, this is 2 times the square root of 2 and then the units, the square units become units, plain old units. So if the original data was in feet, this will be in feet. If the original data was in inches, the variance would be in square inches, the standard deviation will be in just inches. Okay. And there you go. And then you can punch this in the calculator and, and round it. You know, this is this is approximately 2.8 something. All right. So uh, yeah, there's the standard deviation. Very easy once you have the variance. All right. And uh, on the calculator, All right, let me pull up the calculator again. So I had the variance there. Now you could find the variance and then take the square root of that answer, right? And there's the you know 2.828. You see how it's about 2.83 that they're showing on the page here, the the web the website. Um, but you can actually see standard deviation of a list of data uh, through that one variable stats. So you've seen me use that for the quartiles and the median and the mean. So I've got that list of data already entered, right? List one. If I hit the stat button, go over to calc, and you know I just got that one very that one set of data. So I go one variable stats, you know, list one, no frequency list, right? There's no frequency list. Calculate. You see what comes up? Now the top number, x bar, that's the mean. This, you see the sigma symbol? That's the sum of the values. The sum of all those values was 25, right? The values, if you go back up here, were 2, 3, 4, 8, 8. Add those up, you get 25. That's what this is showing in the calculator. Uh, the sum of x squareds is 157. This is not super important. This is if you were to take these values and square them. So like, you know, 2 squared and then plus four, 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 8 squared plus 8 squared. If you were to add those squares up, you'd get 157. What's really important here are the, these lines. So you see s, s, 2.828, remember the, that was what I got earlier, 2.828 or about 2.83 for the sample standard deviation. That's this SX line. That's the sample standard deviation right there. 2.828, four blah, blah, blah. Now careful, the line below it, this is the lowercase sigma. This symbol below the S, this is the symbol for the population standard deviation, right? If all five of these values were the entire population, then I'd be dividing by n, my, you know, n instead of n minus one and get this value, okay? But we're gonna, for the most part, we're gonna be seeing samples. So Sx, the sample standard deviation. This guy below it is again the population standard deviation. So pay attention, be careful, you know which one's which. And then we get into that difference, right? What the sample standard deviation versus the population standard deviation. They talked about the different uh, divisions, right? Well, there's also you know different notation, as you saw in the calculator, right? You're seeing that in the calculator, the different notation. Um, you know, so s s is for the sample standard deviation. This little symbol looks like kind of like a six. Little, uh, this is the you know this is called sigma. This is lowercase sigma. This represents the population standard deviation. 
right? As you're seeing again in the calculator, uh, that same notation, see S sample, little sigma, population, all right? So make sure you know the difference. And the calculations are a little different, right? You know, here you divide by, for the sample variance, you divide by, you know, little n minus one, the sample size minus one. For the population variance, you're dividing by capital N, which is the size of the entire population, and there's no minus one. All right. So be careful. And right, then some definitions here, and then let's get into some problems. Right. So uh, for the following data set, you, know, you are interested in determining the spread of the data. Would you employ calculations for the sample standard deviation? or population standard deviation. Right, so you have to make sure you know, are, am I talking about a sample or a population? So it's the pulse rate for five you know, randomly selected players on a football team. These are, you know, this isn't the entire team. There's just five of them. So I would use calculations for the sample standard deviation. Right, This is a sample of the population. Okay, simple enough. Now I think we actually have to find, find it, right? The following data set represents the pulse rate for five selected players on a team. Find the standard deviation of the data set, round your answer to one decimal place. Again, you could do it the long way, you know, where I find the mean, then I find all those deviations, right? Subtract the mean from every value, then square all the deviations, right? Square them all, then add up all those squares, and then divide by four, right? You know, n minus one, uh, n is five here, and it's a sample, so I divide by n minus one. You could do all that, all right, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just save some time here. You saw me do that by hand earlier. Uh, I'm just gonna go to the calculator and, and, and punch these numbers in. Right, so again, very, very easy to, you know, stat, edit, and I'll clear list one. Now, I think you've seen me clear a list before. You go to where it says L1, hit enter, then clear, then enter again, and the list has disappeared. So I have 66. Uh, it says 66, not 6. Right, 66, 70, 75, 80, and 84. All right, and then I get out of here, quit, and then again, just uh, if I want not, it says you know, if I want the variance, I have to go to that list. But they asked for the sample standard deviation, right? Notice it just asks for s, not s squared. So I can just do that one variable stats, right? Stat, calc, one variable stats, list one, no frequency list, calculate, and again, be careful. This is a sample. So SX, not sigma X. SX is, you know, 7.28, which to one decimal place rounds up to 7.3. So the standard deviation for this particular data set is 7.3 units. Okay, wonderful. And now again, they go through the whole doing it by hand and making a table. You know, so you find the mean, subtract the mean from all the values square all those deviations, add all those squares up, then divide by n minus 1, you know, and then take the square root, right? Because you know, this is the variance, right? 53 would be the sample variance, and then the square root of that would be the sample standard deviation. Okay, so again, if save some time. You know, again, just pra practice it once, maybe twice, just to get used to the notation and stuff and, 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 and finding it. But, you know, the, go to the calculator. Save yourself some time. All right, continuing on here. So this time the height in inches of the four members of a barbershop quartet of singers are listed below. So a barbershop quartet, this is all of them. All right, this isn't a sample. This is every one from this quartet. All four of them. So notice how it says find the population variance. All right, find the population variance. All right. 
So this one, now, now be careful, all right, the calculator, you can find the sample variance easily. Um, you could also do this you know, for the population variance. Now there is no popul now unfortunately on the calculator there's no population variance button. Um, but I can do this. Let me show you. All right, so stat, edit, let's make this list again. So I'm going to pause it, come back when the list is filled in. Okay, so there, the f there's only four values, but it's the entire population. So I get out of here. Now again, I can't, let me show you, I can't do this variance, right? When I go to list and the math and that variance I showed you earlier, uh, I can't I can't do that variance. That variance is a sample variance, so don't use that one. All right, don't use that one. Here's what, here's what you're going to do. Go stat, calc, you know, one variable stats. I have it down list one again, no frequency list, calculate. Now do you see the, now remember this is for the population. So sigma x, this is the population standard deviation. All right, this is the population standard deviation. They want the population variance, right? They want the population variance. So all I need to do is take this population standard deviation, take this sigma x here and square it. Now you could just now you could type in all you know a bunch of these decimals here. Now there's an easier way. See the button that says vars, right? As variables. I hit vars. Go down to where it says number five, see statistics. Hit enter there. And then look, all those things you just entered, you know, the, in the one variable stats show up here. N would be four, right? There are four values. X bar is the mean. SX is the sample standard deviation. Number four, sigma X. I'll hit enter on that. That pops up on the screen. This is the population standard deviation. Right? It comes out as two point whatever. And then all I need to do is square this. And there's your population variance, six and a half. And it said round to one decimal place. Well, it is to one decimal place, right? So just 6.5. And there you go. Now another way, again, another way you could do this is by hand. All right, you could find the mean, find the mean, add them up, divide by four. Then find the deviations, right? Subtract the mean from all four values. Then square those deviations. Then add up those squares. And then divide by four, right? It is a population, so you just divide by the number there are, right? Not minus one. So you could do all that as well if you want to, but like I said, if you know how to do it on your calculator to save some time, you know, do it do it by hand once or twice, but after that, use the calculator, right? Save some time. Because again, they show you here how you would do it by hand and it would again it wouldn't take very long because there's only four values, but it, it takes long enough to where I'd be like, yeah, just do it in the calculator. And then finally, there, you know, the heights and inches. Again, the four members of a pop barbershop quartet. So it's all four of them. It's the population. Now, if the population for this set is 6.5, what is the standard deviation? Round to two decimal places. So I mean, we already had that. All right, I had that up on the calculator here. You know, 6.5 is the what I have in the cal. 6.5 is the variance, population variance, square root of that, which is up here already. Right, two. 2.549, which the two decimal places would round to 2.55. Right, so back here, 2.55 for the population standard deviation of that set. So you got to be careful. You got to pay attention. Do I have a sample? Do I have a population? Okay, and then that that'll tell you which formula you're using or which symbol you should be using on your calculator. All right. So the next, uh, now we finished that objective. Wonderful. The next question is dealing with the objective, you know, compute Z scores. 
z scores. All right, so I'll go to more instruction here and talk about what a z score is. So you've already seen now you've seen what's you know the 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 standard deviation, right? We've seen the standard deviation. A z score is simply the number of standard deviations a particular value is above or below the mean. All right, so when comparing data sets with different means and standard deviations, directly comparing them can be misleading because you know they they have different means and standard deviations. They're they're different data sets. The standard deviation is useful when comparing data values from different sets, but using using the statistical measure called a z-score helps minimize these differences further. So again, a z-score is a statistical measurement of a data value's re pardon me, relationship to the mean of a set. It indicates the number of standard deviations from the mean a value lies. A z-score is positive if the value is above the mean, and negative if the value is below the mean. A data with a value with a, a data value with a z-score of zero is equal to the mean. Right. So how do you find a, these z scores? So for a population, and you know, remember the, these symbols mu and sigma are just x bar and s for a sample. Okay. So um, for a population with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, the z score corresponding to data value x is you know first you take in the numerator here take the deviation, right? The deviation, how far is the value from the mean? And then you divide by the standard deviation, you know, to say how many standard deviations go into that, right? And that's it. And this has no units, right? So if, if, if the data is in inches or miles or feet or degrees or whatever, a z-score has no units, you'll have unit cancellation because the numerator and denominator will both be in inches or the numerator and denominator will both be in feet and the units will cancel. That's why it's a good measure to compare different data sets because if there are no units involved, you know, normally you can't compare something in inches to something in degrees Fahrenheit, right? But if I have measures with no units like this z-score, then it makes, you know, comparing meaningful. Like I said, uh, mu and sigma are x bar and s when you're talking about a sample. Right, so they go through an example here. I'll just get to some problems. Right. And I'll write it out by hand. All right, so here, so two swimmers, you know, Angie and Beth, uh, from different teams, right, want to find out who had the fastest time when compared to her team. Right. Not when compared to each other, because that'd be easy. You know, right away I can see that Angie is faster. Right. Angie is a faster swimmer than Beth. So you're not directly comparing them. You're comparing them to how they did against their own respective team. All right. And this is a, what, sometimes referred to as a measure of relative standing. So I'm going to go to a paper here and, and, and have this information. Okay, so I've written down that information. So Angie swam her time, you know, 26.2 seconds. Angie's team had an average time of 27.2 seconds. So she was faster than, you know, the average person on her team. And the standard deviation for Angie's team was 0 0.8. All right. Beth, she's on a different team, remember. You know, she swam 27 point, you know, it took her 27.3 seconds to do the same kind of, you know, the same swim, maybe 100 meters or whatever. Um, uh, 100 meters, that'd be really fast, but anyway. Um, and her team, Beth's team, averaged 30.1 seconds. And the standard deviation for Beth, Beth's team was 1.4 seconds, right? Now, looking at these two standard deviations tells you something. See, the standard deviation for Angie's team 
is smaller than for uh, Beth's team. So this means that Angie's team had more consistent times. Their times weren't as spread apart as Beth's team. Angie's team had more consistent times. Again, because it's, it's a smaller standard deviation, there's less spread. All right, there's more spread in the times for best team. Um, and then you look at the, the mean times here. Right, the, the, see Angie's team had a smaller mean time. So that just means Angie's team was faster on average, right? Angie's team was faster on average than uh, best team, right? if you look at the, the mean times. All right, but we're not doing all that. Right? What, we're doing, what we're asked to do is calculate Z scores for Angie and Beth. Right. So for Angie, right. I'll say Z... Z sub A for Z, the Z score for Angie. Remember, a Z score is how many standard deviations away from the mean are you? Right. So for Angie's team, you know, she 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 swam 26.2 seconds, and then what's the deviation from the mean for her team minus the 27.2? So that's Angie's score minus you know her team's mean. Then how you know and then then you ask how many standard deviations is that? I divide by 0 0.8. Again, this is z score equals x minus mu divided by sigma, or you know x minus x bar divided by s if you're talking about a sample. It's the same calculation. All right, so this is equal to uh, now that's uh, n you know negative one, and then you know divided by 0 0.8. That's negative one divided by four fifths. That's negative five fourths. This is negative 1.25, and you can calculate it. All, so again, what this means right, when I calculate the z score, this means that you know Angie's time, Angie's time is 1.25 standard deviations I'm just going to put st stood devs below right because it's negative below the the mean for her team right okay then the z score right, the z score for beth Uh, again, I'm going to go Z sub B you know, for Beth. The Z score for Beth is, again, her score, her time, 27.3 seconds, minus, and then the the mean score for the, you know, the, the team she's on, which was 30.1 seconds, divided by the standard deviation for the team she's on, right, the group she's in, which is 1.4. All right, so I'm gonna punch that in. Um, it's not as nice as the other one. Wait a minute, actually it is. This is this up here. This is negative 2.8 uh, divided by 1.4. This is negative two. All right, so Beth's z-score is uh, negative two, meaning that Beth's time is you know two standard deviations below, because it's negative, right, below the mean. Now, if you look at these, Beth had, you know, was two standard deviations faster than the rest of her team on average. But in Angie, was only one and a quarter standard deviations faster, uh, 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 faster than her team, better than her team on average. So that means Beth, if you look at the two scores, Beth was faster compared to her team than Angie was when compared to hers. So Beth was faster, you know, when compared to her team.
than Angie was when compared to hers. Alright, that's what, that's, what, that's what is meant by relative standing. Z-score is a measure of relative standing. It's, it's, a, it's a measure of, you know, how did you do compared to your group? And then this, you know, how, and then you look at somebody else, how they do compared to their group. You know, it's all, it's all relative, relative to their group. So yes, Angie was faster than Beth overall, but when you compare them to their own teams, Beth was, you know, faster compared to her team than Angie was. Right, com when they compared to the rest of their team. So back to the z-scores. You know, all all right, I have to answer the z-scores. The z-score for Angie, again, was uh, negative 1.25. And the z-score for Beth was negative 2. And they go through here. And, yeah, they give you the calculations and all that eventually. But it's your score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That's a Z score. And then, like I said, based on the Z scores calculated above for Angie and Beth, which swimmer had the fastest time when compared to her team? Right? Not just had the fastest time. Like like I've been saying, you know, Angie had the fastest time. But when compared to her team, Beth was faster compared to her team than Angie was compared to hers, right? And they explain down here. Now they both have negative Z scores, meaning both swim in less time than their team's mean time, but in terms of swim times, lower values are faster times. So Beth had the faster time because she had the lower value. Negative 2 is you know lower than negative 1.25 when compared to her team. So again, a similar question. Now this time we don't have to calculate Z scores. We are told Z scores. You know, uh, Carl and Fredo are basketball players who want to find out how they compare to their team in points per game. The mean amount of points per game and standard deviations for their team were calculated. Carl's Z score was 0.9. That means that Carl, if you took his his you know his points per game subtracted the mean for the team and then divided by the standard deviation for the team you get 0.9 All right so Carl's points per game is 0.9 standard deviations above the mean for the team because it's positive Fredo's z score is negative 0.65 so if you so if you look at Fredo's points per game it is 0.65 standard deviations below, right, because it's negative, below the mean for the team. All right, so which of the following statements are true about Carl and Fredo compared to their team in points per game? And select all that apply, right? So Carl scores 0.9 more points per game than the average of his teammates. No. This is 0.9 standard deviations, right? We don't know what the standard deviation is. So this is not 0.9 points more. This is 0.9 standard deviations of points more. Uh, Frodo's average points per game is 0.65 standard deviations greater than his teammates' average points per game. No, less, because it's negative. Carl's average points per game is 0.9 standard deviations greater than his teammates' average. Yes, that's what z-score means, and that's a positive, so it means it's greater exactly. Fredo's average points per game is closer to the team's mean than Carl's. Yes. See, Fredo's average, uh, this is, you know, Fredo's score is 0.65 standard deviations away from the mean, it's below, whereas Carl's uh, points per game is 0.9 standard deviations away from the mean. You know, and 0.9 standard deviations away is farther than 0.65. All right. So Fredo's average points per game is closer to the team's mean than Carl's. Right. Again, they go through the explanation there. Okay. 
you know, which of the data sets represented by the following. All right, so this is interpret the standard deviation of a set of data. Now, I've already talked about standard deviation, so you can go into the more instruction. I'm not. All right, I've already explained standard deviation a little bit. Remember, standard deviation is a measure of spread. The further spread out the data is, the larger the standard deviation. The more tightly packed it is, the smaller the standard deviation. Right. So let's just go through these problems. So which of the data sets represented by the following histograms has the smallest standard deviation or the smallest spread? So that data, you know, you're spreading from 2 to 18 here. There's a lot of values in the middle, but, you know, there's a lot, you know, if there's a big peak, that means it's more packed. You know, there's a lot more packing in here, less spread. You're not going out from, you know, 2 to 18 here. Oh, this one's definitely spread out. Lots of spread. This one's packed too, but not as tightly packed, right? The hill's not as, you know, you got, you got, you're ranging from like 4 to 16. This is only ranging from 4 to 14, and it's taller. All right, it's more more packed in to this central area around 9. So this, this data set, this picture, is the most tightly packed set of data. So it, has this, it would have the smallest standard deviation, the least amount of spread. And I would say that, you know, I'd say that this set here is probably the one with the greatest standard deviation. But again, I don't know exactly what the data value is, but this one's definitely the most tightly packed. So it has the smallest standard deviation. And again, they go through the explanation down here, right? Standard deviation is a measure of how spread out the data is, right? If the values are concentrated around the mean, then a data set has a low standard deviation or lower standard deviation. <clears throat> a histogram with a taller hill like this one had a taller hill indicates higher frequencies of the same values. Right? There's a lot of the same values, a lot of values around 9, a lot of values around you know, 7, uh, from you know, 6 to 8 and all that, uh, and has a lower standard deviation than a histogram with a shorter hill and wider range of values. Right? This is, again, more packed, more tightly packed, more dense means less spread and a lower standard deviation. All right, same here. Uh, now this time we're just looking at <clears throat> means and standard deviations. So Salvatore, you know, as a director of a regional bank, is concerned about the wait times of customers at the four branches of his bank. You know. He randomly selects 48 patrons in each branch and records the waiting time for each patron. The results of the samples are shown below. All right, so this uh, the Alvrine branch has an you know, average waiting time, mean waiting time of 13.49 minutes with a standard deviation of 1.97 minutes, and it goes through the four branches here. Which of the branches has the most inconsistent waiting times? Now, I talked about consistency before, right, right here. The smaller the standard deviation, the more tightly packed the, 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 the data is, the more consistent the data. The larger the standard deviation, the more spread the data is, and that means there's some high, some low, right? You know, it's less consistent, right? So which of these branches has the most inconsistent waiting times, meaning the largest standard deviation, the largest spread? And that would be the two point, uh, I'm sorry, the 3.12. So the Mascamonet branch, however you say that, has the most inconsistent because it has the largest standard deviation. It would have the largest spread of times. All right, and that's correct and all that. And read the explanation. Right. So another one, interp interpreting standard deviation. Uh, suppose there is an estate sale featuring many items sold at different prices. The mean selling price is $75. The standard deviation is $20. A piece of costume jewelry is priced at $15. All right, which of the following statements is true? So this is just basically like z-score, right? How many standard deviations from the mean? You know, how many uh, is it? How many how many standard deviations to the right of the mean, above the mean, or to the left of the mean, below the mean? 
All right, so I can pull up a paper here and you know this piece of jewelry. Let's find the z-score. Uh, the piece of jewelry was fifteen dollars, so fifteen it, it's its cost. What's the deviation minus the mean? Right, they said the mean selling price was seventy-five dollars, and then we see how many standard deviations is that? Right, D divide by the standard deviation, which was twenty. So this is a negative sixty in the numerator divided by twenty. That's negative three. So a z-score of negative three. Remember, means that. The, this this 15 right the price of this jewelry this costume jewelry is three standard deviations below the mean because it's negative or to the left of the mean if you want to think of below as to the left like on a number line so three standard deviations to the left of the mean all right, all right um same question as earlier, right? You know, which one has the smallest, which set of data would have the smallest standard deviation? So which one's the most tightly packed? Well, these are way far apart. All right, lots of spread there. Two hills. You know. Ooh, look at that. Super packed. All, right, all the values are from 40 to 44, and, and all, all of them. There, there's not a lot of spread. Not a lot of spread here either, but this one, definitely. There's barely any spread in this data, so this has the smallest standard deviation of all the ones I just saw. All right. We got another z-score problem. Um, I'm just going to do the instructor cheat here. You've seen me do how to do z-scores. You would do it for this Illinois and Florida here. Just take every value, take each value, subtract its mean. Right, and then divide by that group's standard deviation. Right. And then they're probably going to ask a question about it after. Right. And based on the z scores calculated above for Stevens Electric bills, again, I'm just going to do the cheat here. You, you, you determine that. You can. It's just like the problem earlier with Angie and Beth. All right. All right. Now the last two objectives are about. Um, how much data is within certain numbers of dis, uh, standard deviations in any distribution. So I'm going to do the more instruction here. Use, understand the principles of Chebyshev's theorem. All right. So these are all well and good, but this is you know for any data set no matter what the distribution looks like. You know, if you look at a histogram, you know, it could be left skewed, right skewed, symmetrical, whatever. For any data set, no matter what the distribution of the data, at least 75% of the data will be within two standard deviations of the mean. Right? We'll have a z-score between negative two and two. At least 89% of the data will be within three standard deviations of the mean. Right? So have z-scores between negative three and three and at least 95% of the data will be within four and a half standard deviations of the mean. Right? So ha at least 95% of the data values in any data set will have z-scores between negative 4.5 and positive 4.5. Right. Uh, so you got that there. Now um, this can be more generalized. All right, let's, let's get through this problem here first. So here it says, uh, you know, the members of Maggie's choir have a mean height of five, 58 inches with a standard deviation of 4 inches. The choir includes both children and adults, and the distribution of their heights is not symmetric, right? It doesn't, uh, like you saw in the box earlier, right? The, this Chebby Chef's rule is, apl is applicable to any distribution, whether it's symmetric or not. Right. Between what two heights? Does Chebyshev's theorem guarantee that we'll find approx at least approximately 89% of the choir members? All right. So again, that uh, paper here. So Chebyshev's theorem. Right, Chebyshev's. 
Um, one of those statements was at least 89% of the data of any data set is going to be within three standard deviations. All right of the mean. All right, so what was the mean? All right, the mean height for this uh, particular example was 58 inches. All right, and the standard deviation for this choir was 4 inches. So I just need to add three standard deviations, right? Plus 3 times 4. So that's plus 12. So if I add 12, that's, you know, 70 inches. And then I subtract three standard deviations, minus 3 times 4, or minus 12. Uh, that'd be uh, 46 inches. Um, so from 4, you know, so 80, 80 at least, right? That means at least 89% of the choir members is, you know, in between these heights. Forty-six inches and seventy inches. Three standard deviations below. Three standard deviations above. All right, so I'll enter those right between forty-six and seventy, and they go through the. You know, they restate the rule again. All right. All right. Now, here's a more general statement. This is this now you know the last the last box I showed you said that you know at least 75% is within two at least 89% of the data will be within three standard deviations of the mean at least 95% will be within you know four and a half standard deviations of the mean this is a much more general statement that apply that that, that holds for those three as well so again for any data set the proportion of data values that lie within k standard deviations of the mean is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. All right, 1 minus 1 over k squared. And let me show you why that is exactly the same as the box you saw earlier. Right. So the 1 minus 1 over k squared, you know, when k equals 2, that's 1 minus a quarter, right, 2 squared, which is 3 quarters, which is 75%. Right. I remember earlier it said at least 75% of the data values will be within two standard deviations. And when k equals 3, this is 1 minus 1 ninth, which is 8 ninths, which is approximately 89%, right? That's, the, that's from the page earlier, right? At least 89% of, of any data set will be within three standard deviations of the mean. All right, so this is just more general. You know, what if we're talking about two and a half? standard deviations or 3.5 you know then we're gonna go to this 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 expression here to say about how much data at least how much data can we expect to be within those those values all right so they go through an example here I'll just pull up a problem so according to Chebyshev's theorem for any again any distribution whether it's symmetrical or not um, at least what proportion of the data are within two and a half standard deviations of the mean and round your answer to the nearest whole number. All right, so remember back here on my paper, you know, when, so when k equals 2.5, this, you know, at, at least one minus one over 2.5 squared, and I'll put it, I'll pull up the calculator and we'll do this. All right, so, um, you know, one minus and then one divided by, you know, 2.5 squared, and it's going to square the 2.5 first, like it should. 84, right? This is 0.84. This is uh, 0.84, which is the same as 84%. And that is a nice whole number. So according to Chebyshev's theorem, the Chebyshev's rule, at least 84% of any data set is within two and a half standard deviations of the mean. All right. So at least 84% of any data set is within two and a half standard deviations of its mean. And again, they go through the same thing I just did. All right, punching in 2.5 for K. Right. 
and change it to a percentage. Alright. So that was Chebyshev's theorem. Now, there's one other rule that you need to learn. Now, this is the empirical rule. Chebyshev's theorem, all right, Chebyshev's rule was for any, any distribution, any shape. And the word at least came up, you know, at least 75% of the data will be within two standard deviations of the mean, at least 89%. So that means that much or more. This next rule, all right, this next rule called the empirical rule, the empirical rule is only for, uh, you know, symmetrical bell-shaped, very specific symmetrical bell-shaped distributions, uh, otherwise referred to as normal distributions. Right, so things that are like this, you know, if you look at histograms, the, the, they'll go up and then come down and be very symmetrical and a bell shape. Right? So this rule is only for uh, bell shaped, symmetrical, nor what are called normal distributions. Right? So let me show you the more instruction for this empirical rule. So understand the principles of the empirical rule, right? Again, different different from Chebyshev's rule. So this is the, so for data having a distribution that is symmetric and bell-shaped, all right, gotta be both. If it's not symmetric or not bell-shaped, then this rule does not apply, all right? But if it is a symmetric bell-shaped distribution, now notice the word at least is not here. It's now approximately, so close to, Right. approximately 68% of the data will be within one standard deviation of the mean. One. Approximately 95% of the data will be within two standard deviations of the mean of that data set. And approximately 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. So notice again, it's the word approximately, not at least, Right? In Chebyshev's rule, it was at least this much or more. This is approximately, meaning close to, so around 68%, almost precisely, of the data will be between one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean. And around 95% of the data, almost exactly, will be, above, will be within two standard deviations of the mean, and almost exactly 99.7% of the data, right around, not at least, Almost exactly 99.7% of the data will be within three standard deviations of the mean. All right, and they indicate that junk here. All right. um, so get these numbers in your head. 68, 95, 99.7, one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviations. All right, you can read through the examples on your own. I'm just going to go to our problem. Right. So suppose a random sample of adult women has a, has a mean height of 64.3 inches with a sample standard deviation of 2.4 inches, S equals 2.4. Since height distribution, right, says here, is generally symmetrical and bell-shaped, that means we can apply this empirical rule that was stated, you know, up here. Since height distribution is generally symmetric and bell-shaped, we can apply the empirical rule. So between what two heights are approximately 99.7% of the women? All right. 99, uh, the, the data here is these women's heights. So between what two heights are 99, approximately 99.7% of these women's heights? All right. So again... I'm just going going to some paper here. Um, I'll pull it up actually just on this screen. So again, we got the mean, right? The mean height for this sample of women was 64.3 inches. And according to this empirical rule, right? It's a symmetric. It's a distribution, right? Distribution of heights is symmetrical 
and bell shaped, pardon me, if it's symmetrical and bell shaped. And I want to know, you know, between what two values is approximately 99.7% of the data. That's three standard deviations above, so plus three you know, S's, right, and S was, uh, the standard deviation was 2.4. So I'm going to add three times 2.4, right, or add um, 7.2. And if I add 7.2 to 64.3, that's, you know, 81.5 inches on the high end. And then going this way, I'm going to subtract three standard deviations from the mean. Because right, again, approximately or about 99.7% of the data will be within three standard deviations of the mean. So I subtract three standard deviations or minus three times 2.4, right, minus 7.2. And if I subtract 7.2, uh, that'll be 57.1, 57.1 right, inches. Right. Um, so between so for all the women in this sample, about 90, 99.7 or approximately 99.7% of all the women in the sample will have heights between these two heights. I'll just say of all the women. Okay. We'll have heights between 57.1 uh, inches and 81.5 inches and they asked us to round to the nearest tenth. So I'm just going to enter those. Those were already to the tenth, right? To the tenth place. So between uh, 57.1 and 81.5. Oops, did I multiply wrong? Or add wrong? Let's see. Oh, yeah, not 81.5. I did add wrong. 71.5. My apologies. Back to the paper. Yeah, arithmetic mistake. 64.3 plus 7.2 is, you know, 71.5. All right, so 57. Uh, uh, okay, sorry about that. Check your work. <laughs> so there, all right. Yeah, so 99.7% of the women will be within those range, within those heights. Uh, another one uh, applying to the empirical rule. For the same random sample of adult women with a sample height of, you know, a mean, mean of 64.3 and standard deviation 2.4, same, same sample. Use the empirical rule to determine the approximate percentage of heights. How, what percentage of these women have a height between 59.5 and 69.1? Alright, so back to the page here. And same mean same standard deviation, but now we're asked about what percentage are between 59.5 to, you know, inches to 60, 69.1. Remember, 64.3 is the mean, you know, X bar here. So now I just got to think, what's, what's the difference, what's the distance between 64.3 and uh, 9.1? That's 4.8, right? Uh, these are 4.8 apart, and same thing here. These are 4.8 apart, and I'm trying to double check my arithmetic this time. Yeah, 64.3 plus 4.8 would be 69.1. 64.3 minus 4.8 would be 59.5. And how many standard deviations is that? That's two. Po Remember, the standard deviation is 2.4. This 4.8 is two standard deviations. That's 2s. 2s. So these two values, 59.5 to 69.1, we're talking within, any value in here is within two standard deviations. So by the empirical rule, approximately 95% of the women's heights would be within those two heights there. 95%, almost exactly 95%, approximately 95% of the women will have heights between 59.5 inches and 69.1 inches. That's within two standard deviations of the mean. All right, so back here using one of the numbers, you know, 90, 95%. Right. 
again, they go through and show you that they're two standard deviations away from the mean, both those values. Okay. And then the rest of the problems, uh, you know, here again, the empirical rule being talked about here, uh, when data is symmetric and bell-shaped. Okay. And, uh, you know, same, same kind of problems here. So we have a question, which this is the same. Oh, okay. Now this is a little different. Returning to the sample of adult women, you know, mean height 64.3, standard deviation 2.4. Use the empirical rule again to estimate the percentage of heights that are less than 61.9. Right. So I'll draw a picture. All right. So here's a picture relating to these same heights again. Remember the, the average was 64.3 inches, the standard deviation is 2.4. Here I've drawn a bundle, above a little number line a symmetrical bell-shaped curve, a symmetrical bell-shaped distribution. Um, and you know here's the mean, and then you know 64.3, 66.7 is the mean plus one standard deviation. 61.9 inches, this is what's being asked about, is uh, you know the mean minus one standard deviation. And we're asked about, you know, estimate the percentage of heights that are less than 61.9. So approximate this percentage here. All right, this is the area less. With, uh, all the women with heights over here have a height less than 61.9 inches. Right, I want to find that, you know, the whole thing should be 100%. All right, the whole thing is 100%. Everything over here, right, is, it's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. So this over here to the right of the middle is 50%. Right? That's half the half the distribution. And according to that empirical rule, remember within one standard deviation, the amount of women between, you know, the amount of women's heights within one standard deviation should be approximately 68%, right? According to that empirical rule. So from here to here, right? That's from here to here is about 68%. Okay. Um, that means, again, using the symmetry, right? If it's perfectly, you know, if it's symmetrical and bell-shaped like this, if from here to here, right, within one standard deviation is 68%, then this area here just half of it is approximately 34 percent. Right. So to the right half, that's 50. This little area here is 34. So that's totally 84 above. 84 percent above 61.9, but we're asked about below, which would be about 16 percent then, right? to make the total of 100. And so you can use this, use the fact that 68% should be within one, 95% within two, 99.7% within three, and use the symmetry and the fact that the whole thing needs to add up to 100%. We can see that about 16% of the women would have a height less than 61.9 uh, inches. So hopefully that picture made some sense. But you use the empirical rule and the fact that you have a symmetrical bell-shaped curve distribution to help break up percentages, break it up into pieces. And I think they might draw a picture like that down here. Mm, no, they don't. Okay. Um... I think this might be a, oh, this is now Chebyshev's rule. Okay, and I think the rest of these are similar. So this is Chebyshev's theorem. Again, you can click on more instruction if you don't recall what it is. But, you know, I already did a problem like this. So I'm just going to do the instructor cheat. And, uh, you know, we're running almost an hour and 20 here. You've seen me do a problem with Chebyshev's rule. You've seen what Chebyshev's rule is. So hopefully, you can, and you've seen me do a problem similar to this. So again, hopefully you could fill in something like this. And again, with Chebyshev's rule, very similar. 
Okay. Just again, if you're if you're unfamiliar, if you if you want more, you know, click on more instruction. But again, a very very similar thing to another Chebby Chef's rule problem I did earlier, and then the rest are these empirical rule problems. Okay, so again, you can, you know, I, I would recommend drawing a picture like this, marking off the mean under the peak, under the top and then going one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, and breaking it up into pieces and using the fact that, hey, yeah. You know, uh, now you could have also done this with this one, you know, there's 68 in here, meaning there's got to be 32 in the outside, and then half of 32 is 16. That might have been faster as well, all right? However you want to do it, just use the fact that you have symmetry to break it up. But the rest of these are similar using the empirical rule, all right? Similar to problems I did earlier in the assignment. All right, using you know 68, 95, 99.7. And I think I got one more here then. Right. Yeah, it's it's exactly like a problem earlier. All right, so you can do these. You know, I've done similar ones. You can do them on your own. And that should be it for this assignment. I've covered every objective. Right, I've shown you examples of problems from every objective. Oh, they got one more for me here. Yeah, and this is the same as earlier, the same kind of problem like with the women's heights. So, again, you, uh, you, 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 can, you can figure that out, hopefully, again, using the fact that you have symmetry. Right, and using those numbers, 68, 95, 99.7, within one, within two, within three standard deviations in some, you know, symmetrical bell-shaped distribution. Yeah, and that, that should be it. Okay. So, again, you're not going to see exactly the same problems in exactly the same order as I did. Um, but, you know, the same objectives will be there, uh, the same, you know, the way you do them will be the same as well, um, you know, and so hopefully going through this, uh, video, you know, it's a little, it's a little longer one, you know, there were five objectives and, you know, they talk about, um, you know, but finding the variance, the standard deviation, uh, z-scores, right? and then these chubby chefs and empirical rule. Right? Those, those are the keys to all these, and hopefully watching my video gives you a nice little guide through when you're doing the assignment on your own. Right? And if you have any questions, of course, let me know, and thank you very much for watching.